is bound to be around us. The earlier colonial discourse of Africa as a land of darkness and mystery is now myth. New horizons of dark uh, thinking are opening. New writers, performers, critics, scholars are emerging. In this session, we hope to get a glimpse of all this literary and cultural pluralism. Let's hope all of us will enjoy the session. With the permission of Professor Rai Chaudhuri, and without wasting any more time, I'll invite our uh, presenter, that is Mr. P. Harita, uh, to uh, present his view. Yes, um, on transcending boundaries, politics of friendship in Zakaria Mahmoud Sundani from Nigeria. So, Mr. Harita, are you there? I don't think uh, Harita is Harita P is there. Please respond if you are there. No, I don't think uh, she is. No, he is. Uh, in that case, I think we should uh, invite our next presenter to present her paper. Exactly. That is uh, uh, Hina Sharma. Hina Sharma from the Department of English, CCS University, Merut, UP. So please, madam, uh, I invite you to present your paper. Please uh, switch on your microphone and, and video present. Uh, is she there? I think she's not there as well. Is not there. Okay, so we move on to the next presenter then. Uh, that is uh, Himakshi Kashyap. Madam Kashyap. Yeah, she is uh, here. I can see her icon. So uh, I invite her to present her paper uh, Legitimizing Female Subversion in uh, Bushi Emesekas, The Joy of, Joys of Motherhood. Reading Motherhood as a Patriarchal Institution. Please, I invite uh, uh, Madam Kashyap to yes. present her paper. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Am I Please. audible, ma'am? Yes, you are audible, yes. but I think you yes. also have to be visible uh, for Am the presentation. I my video as I have network issues here so okay. that I can carry on uh, easily. I think if Can you I? do not have any presentation, uh, I mean PPT or something, I think it would be all right. Yes, please. Yes, ma'am, I will be doing oral presentation. Okay. Can I proceed, ma'am? Yes, okay. please proceed. Um, I think uh, let me just um, uh, announce this. Uh, all participants or presenters will be given eight minutes of time. And uh, we will open the session for question and answer for uh, like one or two minutes after this presenter. Please proceed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone present online. I am Himaksi Kashyap uh, from Assam. Uh, today, my paper is entitled Legitimizing Female Subversion in Busi Image Shutters, The Joys of Motherhood, Reading Motherhood as a Patriarchal Institution. I have attempted to analyze how motherhood in this novel is projected as a patriarchal institution through all its uh, um, all its uh, facets. Uh, so I start with my uh, paper. African li literature provides its readers a very interesting reading experience with all the socio-cultural, political specialities of the native African people. It opens up a plethora of variant cultures, social structures, and human relationships related with essence, rural landscapes, locality, folklore, tradition, and so on. Busi Imechetel's works are very beautifully projected documents about the rich African culture, whereas they can even of the real life experiences of the African people 
mostly dominated by poverty, slavery, suffering, and struggle. The selected novel by Ibrahim such a text where not only the text of the devastating African societies at the onslaught of colonialism is recorded, but also the bitter realities of marital relationships transforming human values are explored to its best. The seemingly ordinary experience of a woman, motherhood, is so very minutely expressed in this novel through portrayal of some common Igbo and Yoruba women uh, that we as readers are made to pause and think whether motherhood is really so important for a woman. Imacheta's protagonist, Nu Igo, is a very ordinary woman whose sole aim of life was to become a mother. Not only her, but all the other fellow women too are shown to be busy bearing and giving, uh, giving birth to children. Even their conversations, activities, aspirations are all subjected to their children and their husband's interest. Marriage is regarded as essential for legally having children. Uh, but here, marriages are trivialized. The focus is uh, to give birth to a child. That particularly a male male child. For that, they have many ways, just like keeping mistresses, uh, inheriting inheriting the late brother's wife, enslaving, etc. All of these are required or legitimized as, as requirements for bringing as many children as possible so that the legacy of the male is sustained. So that he can live even after his death in the form of his sons. These are all nothing but patriarchal systematization of the society, whereby female folks are tactfully exploited on different levels, suppressing them unknowingly until their death. No ego is caught in this patriarchal institution of motherhood. Her first marriage failed as she couldn't bear a child for her husband. She was leveled as quote unquote barren. This, however, didn't put off the flame of hope from her mind. She tried her luck entering a new marriage with a man who already had wives and children. Her desperate aspiration for children was approved by her chi, her personal god, and she became mother to a bunch of children throughout years. Her husband, the giver, who was capable of only giving her the children, not the whole, not uh, capable of taking the responsibilities of the children. He was bound to work hard to look after the children, from food to clothes to their education, thus uh, doubly exploited and subverted in the institutional space of motherhood. She is taught by her culture that her identity is dependent on her children, particularly the sons, apart from her father and her husband. In the process of ma maintaining that ideal identity of a happy mother with so many children, they got lost. She aged early, frustrated, and finally died with no one by her side. Such an illusion this motherhood is. It teaches you to be caring, selfless, nurturing, and pleasing. It gives you nothing for yourself, but so much for others through you. It enslaves your body, divides it in, in between your husband and your children purposively. It rewards you with never-ending tension, confusion, instability, and inexpressible pains and sufferings. Motherhood is beautiful, but patriarchization of it has deformed its beauty. At least, this is what Nuigo's story reveals to us in this novel. Such a study further help in exploring the institutional execution of motherhood in different socio-cultural landscapes in the world. So with this, I end my paper. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I invite um, all of you, if you have any questions to ask, please post the questions uh, for, for everybody's convenience.
okay uh, so it was a uh, uh, like a very uh, interesting paper uh, that questioned the these the institution that i think we celebrate most in our culture that we consider sacred and thank you for analyzing that how even in that sacred institution that has its roots in the biology patriarchy still works to exploit women's labor and body so i would like to invite our next presenter indrani bondopadhyay uh, assistant professor in english faculty of liberal art uh, icfai uh, university tripura she will be presenting the uh, living life as black women selective study of uh, gwendolyn brooks poetry so, yes yes thank you uh, uh you may start your presentation uh thank you madam uh let me share my screen i have slide yes please confirm me if it is visible uh, uh i it cannot see anything as yet yes uh, yes it's visible is this visible ma'am okay it's, it's visible. thank you so much so uh, good evening everyone I'm Indrani Bondobadhyay. Today I'm going to present a paper. Uh, the title of my presentation is "Living Life as Black Woman: Selective Study of Like Books Poetry." So, before reading her poetry in the context of American literature, we have to understand the concept of hyphenated identity. We all know that in the late 1960s, from the early 1970s, that Black Power movement it happened. and as a result us government changed the immigration law and earlier only it was eurocentric only american but ultimately the cultural pluralism took place like officially they were having their own identity it was no longer only american literature american people it was african american literature it was like chicago american literature the plurality the kind of salad bowl comes in between so in this context brook is a post harlem renaissance writer was nonetheless a part of the new negro era and as a lifetime resident of chicago she participated in the energetic intellectual and artistic life of the depression era black chicago writers literary movement a prolific writer Brook wrote more than 20 books or books of poetry including children's poetry numerous articles and essays several writings manuals one novel along with her like uh, memoir so in the context of brook's writing we have to understand the background because every text is actually the product of the context so context creates the text so in order to read black like, brick breaks poetry brooks poetry we have to understand that she was the person who witnessed the revival of the black art movement where black artists in every sphere of creative art had turned into themselves clean their house and they were actually raising their voice in order to prove themselves that they they were aware of the other world around of them and more specifically the part they intended to be in so in this context group type started writing and mainly uh, my presentation is having this paper is having three objectives the first objective of this presentation to analyze in what way brook represent the lives of the black woman in the context of african american literature and culture the second topic objective of this presentation is that to look the black woman's perspective towards life because perspective differs if we have a glass of water or a half glass of water some can some people might say that it's half full the other people might say it's half empty so perspectives matters a lot so in what way the black woman like has represent the life through their own perspective and interestingly these poetries are important because they are written from a insider's point of view so it's from within so there is no distance between the subject and the writing so being a insider being that black woman book wrote that is why they are authentic they are carrying the signature they are carrying the autobiographical element they are carrying the first person narrative form they are having authentic representation a truthful representation so the third like uh, the objective of this 
like presentation is to find out the significance of this writing in the contemporary world because at the same part of time we have to acknowledge the fact that there are few issues the women the problems of women they are same across places and spaces that is why there is no single feminism but there are plural of plurality of feminism because they are different from places to places but samara the other these writings are in, in significant because in the context of in the contemporary world also we can find out the women also suffered a lot so the the, the people my paper is based on like four selective poetries the poetries are the sunset of the city mother kitchenet building from the collection of her first uh, book called street to bronze valley and then jc michel's mother because why i selected these four texts i don't know whether i'll have time or not let us discuss at least two texts in detail because the summer of the other this four texts shared something in common the subject of female the sub the perspectives of female okay so the first poetry is the uh, the sunset of the city it is can be one attempt to of self discovery we have to understand the two things from the title the city and the sunset C city can be a place or space of opportunities for like climbing the ladder in the society on the other hand just in the opposite way sunset is actually the ending of the day so here the poetry if you read the poetry line by like if you look at the poetry you can find out the poetry starts with autobiographical tone where the writer being a woman she is telling already i am no longer looked at with luxury or love my daughters and sons have put me away with marbles and dolls are gone from the house my husband and lovers are pleasant or somewhat polite and night is night so some that the other being a woman's perspective is there in the poetry because we know that from time immemorial women were considered as a kind of machine of creation and recreation of populace the first creation is to give birth here it is very clear in the sunset of the city that she is having son she is having daughter but what happened when she create themselves but when it is hard time sunset time the old age time she cannot find out anyone beside her so the second is recreation of populace where she gave pleasure to the husband pleasure to the beloved but when it is a time for her in need she, she cannot she is alone so the summer of the other we can find out they are the not double they are multiply marginalized so they are marginalized for for their black so summer of the other they are marginalized because of their like woman who because they are female so they are used and they were left behind along with the marbles and dots so these like this poetry is having like multiple symbols also where we can find out the symbols of the marbles the symbols of the grass the dolls so that's why the poetry moves like we with the in the nature and at the end of the day we have to realize that this poetry is a poetry which can if we can fit into the other world also in a contemporary world also in the indian world we can find out in the old place the old home it there are old house there are many people they are alone they are left behind because probably they cannot find out because she in the poetry she is telling that i am a woman and and dusty standing among new affairs i am a woman who hurries to the pairs so she is somewhere at the other she thinks herself as a mistress in the society so that is why this sunset of the city is very interesting poetry where being a black like, woman who talks about the female hood and interestingly somewhere in the interview broke like she commented that why it is important to write about the black because she she thought she was having the kind of motto a kind of ambition to give the truthful representation for example she gave us the reference of a tree suppose someone is writing a poetry of a tree so that if a black is writing a poetry of a tree so that black will have something different in the perspective the, the black will try to probably portray that the tree is burning from within okay so likewise in the other poetry the mother we can find out interesting because the entire poetry is one dramatic monologue on abortion 
so the the mother yes the last presenter actually presented about the woman who so here also we can find out book talked about the motherhood in the poetry from a woman perspective and the poetry dwells between three things you i and you so in the beginning of the poetry the poetry by like begins by telling that emotions will not let you forget you remember the children you got and you did not get so here you he she is addressing to the entire female hood to the entire like uh, to the sister hood to, to the all woman so next thing that we can find out a shift where she is telling it's autobiographical she is telling that i have heart in the voices of the wind the voices of my dim killed children so again she is telling that i if i stole your birth and your name i so be i so a kind of shift so somewhere at the other you can find out a kind of universal quality in the poetry in the mother so ultimately the last you it 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 is it can be directed to the 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 children which she is telling that i could not but give birth to that children who that is why they are you and ultimately she claimed that believe me i loved you all believe me i knew that you are all my so a kind of tension between physical life imagine life so probably in a physical so they are in a pain, so what happened in the american life the pain and paper they were all equal but if we read the text like amiti baraka writings and other things we can find out there is a difference between the theory and the practice so probably they imagined the great american dream but in the in the in the real life they undergo the physical pain so and another kind of tension between the trauma and guilt also because the poetry the context is actually the abortion not only one abortion multiple abortions so Uh, so what can be the reason of the aversion it will take more time to discuss but somewhere at the other there is a trauma guilt of the mother who who feels regretting the life she rendered and lived so likewise the other poetry kitchenet building the third poetry of our discussion is actually again like addressing to the feminine space so we have a stereotypical thinking that the position of the woman is actually in the kitchenet so here actually the poetry again we have it is like having other pronoun we so ultimately at the end of the day she is telling about she is being a african american being a like woman from the american background black colored woman she is addressing we she is calling all the women at the same part of time so likewise in the other poetry this is michelle's mother is interesting because they is having a kind of a disturbed relationship between mother and the daughter and how there is a kind of difference between them so interestingly in order to conclude we can we can argue on the fact that these writings by brook are very important because they are true true because american literature is something which is based on the flesh and blood related literature they started writing their th- literature because they wanted to record their nation so somewhere at the other they are truthful representation somewhere at the other these poetry are giving us one life lesson that black life matter if we know about the contemporary things what is happening surrounding we have to realize that every life matters in the world but somewhere at the other the women they suffered a lot so we have to think of a world where it's very equality so if there are many possible research areas based on brooks poetry they are yet to explore and yet we have to go on because reading brook she claimed that reading is important but read between the lines do not swallow everything so we have to read and realize the brooks poetry in order to have the the perfect essence okay of the literature thank you so much thank you thank you ma'am yeah, thank you thank for, you um thank for, for your fascinating yeah. paper yes uh, uh, let's one, look for our, for any comments and questions yes i have one question for both of our presenters uh, since their topic sort of um um what should i say they both talked about motherhood but different from different perspectives so when um we read uh, about this poem uh, that talks about abortion and side by side we read about the joys of motherhood where do we place motherhood in case of women's identity then it's a question for both the presenters that 
where then should we play, uh, place motherhood? Is it a woman's identity or is it the woman's uh, obligation? So if you can elaborate upon that. Should I an answer or uh, the okay. madam? Yes, uh, whoever, I think. Uh, OK. Yeah. So if you talked about the motherhood, I will say that it is actually a like, gift given by the God. It's all about the woman, whether they are like willing to use that gift in their life or not. But it is, it is a matter of choice. But interestingly, if you think about the African-American woman, it was not their choice anymore. They were somewhere they were forced. So here, if you read the text, The Mother by Brooke, we can find out that she's telling that uh, there is a line that it was not my intention to give, like to the, do the abortion, but somewhere there that she was forced to do. So motherhood actually is a part of the human life because we are given, we are given by the God. The, it is a new gift given, given by the God. But ultimately, it, is, it should be based on the woman's choice. The choice is important. But according to me, I think that they were not having that choice in their life. Yes. That we need to understand. Yes, I think it's all. Uh, thank you for the elaboration. Uh, if um, Himaksima wants to comment anything on that. Uh, yes, ma'am. So any more comments or questions? Yes, yes. Okay. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes. Yes. So, uh, from my perspective, uh, whatever Indrani Ma'am has said, and uh, that is uh, natural. Motherhood is natural. The God, uh, God, uh, it is a God-given thing to the women. But the culture, the society, the social structures, where uh, the traditional beliefs and customs, and also the uh, those myths about the creation of women from that point onwards. So women are uh, supposed to be at the bottom of uh, the uh, social structure. So to legitimize uh, that uh, status of women in the society, um, uh, motherhood is somehow stereotyped uh, by patriarchy that you are a, you you are must do it you are must to bear a child for me if you are not able to conceive then you are barren then you are infertile then you will be looked uh, down by uh, the other members of the society so from that perspective i can say that it is uh, like an obligation for the women uh, to yeah that they they are not uh, the duty of motherhood is not uh, there as experienced by the mothers, in, especially in the novel that I chose. Yes. Yeah, that is what I can say. Yes, so the joys of the motherhood uh, predominantly lies in the choice of the motherhood, I think. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you uh, to both of you. Uh, I would like to invite our next presenter. Irin Samuel, uh, final yes. year uh, postgraduate yes. student from the Department of English, Krishna Jayanti College, Bengaluru. Uh, he will be talking about Chinu Archibald's things fall apart and no longer at things, deterioration of national identity. Please, uh, Irin. Good afternoon, all. Yes. Yeah, good afternoon all. Uh, today I'm going to present on the topic Chinu Archibald's things fall apart and no longer at ease deterioration of national identity. I would like to do screen sharing, ma'am. Yes, please do. Um, I can confirm as we can, as we can see that. Yeah, can you see? Uh, not yet. No? Not yet, I'm afraid. One second. Is it visible? Yes. Uh, wait, it's uh, only a blank screen. It is visible that you are presenting something, but it's a blank screen with your icon. 
yes it's visible now okay ma'am okay thank you and uh, i'm going to present on shino hb since on deterioration of national identity and for that uh, i had took the theme post colonialism and the theory post colonialism yes so now that post colonialism the critical academic study of cultural legacy of colonialism and imperialism uh, focusing on the human of the control and exploitation of colonized people and their lands and the according to in their post colonialism the key concepts they wrote the definition that the post colonialism deals with the effects of colonization on cultures and societies annually used by historians after the second world war in terms such as the post colonial state and the post colonial had a clearly chronological meaning designating the post independence period however from the late 1970s the term has been used by literary critics to the various colonization the the attempts to focus oppression of those who were ruled under colonization and the colonization of slavery and poverty after colonialism important issues for nigeria and the its problem most important issue for and the novel things fall apart those novel novels and fix the conflict between white colonialism of nigeria and the indigenous indigenous traditional culture and uh, the factors include political oppression social cultural oppression and psychological oppression. and the uh, colonial theorists believed that the colonizers generally european imposed their rules on us as we can say that the christian faith of the african society by taking advantage of the lower members of the hierarchy social hierarchy that is ibo and um, they coined the term orientalism by the old and the ocean that is the east and the west that is to have the term essentialism and strategic essentialism and who make post colonial and indian post colonial theorist he feels that the post colonial world should valorize space of mixing space where truth and authenticity move aside for an this space of hybridity he argues offers the most opportunity to colonialism and i'm uh, going to deal with china uh, along with this and the themes in this novel are mainly bribery as a common crime and as the priority discrimination against african and love is not a weapon in nigeria book no longer me set in the independent nigerian era and uh, if we see no longer at this it is a tragic story and uh, according to uh, oh, it is the, the main protagonist is obi okonko and he is a moral strong character however his fatal flaw is uh, his arrogant belief that he can change the entire culture and its norms Obi Okonko, uh, who leaves his village for education in Britain, and then 
a job in the Nigerian Colonial Civil Service, but is conflicted between his African culture and Western lifestyle and ends up taking a bribe. One of Chinwajabe's main social political criticism in no longer it is, is that of corruption in Nigeria. OB Okonko is confronted with the issue of bribery. OB finds himself at the beginning of a generation of change caught between the two worlds. And the Indian power of missionaries, missionaries made them disintegrated from the clan system. As a result, they lost their cultural values. Uh, that is, the missionaries imposed their administration upon the Igbos by the division of southern eastern India, ruled by district commissioners, and appointed as the chiefs, clerks, and leaders to help. The new things fall apart. Slightly uh, taken from William Butler, the second coming. And the themes were gender, family, religion, fear, religion, sin, tradition, and customs, marriage, language, and communication. And uh, in things fall apart, we can religion, father son inheritance, some tradition, believing in evil spirits. And this for part is in small homophobia. Just for the idol of the white missionaries in Umofia, the villages do not be starting several changes with the their structure and institution. And uh, we can see the fall of national identity, that is Okenko's fall. Okenko's fall, is, uh, fall can be related to the Igbo tribe's fall. And in the novel, uh, as well as colonialism, uh, of the East and the West. The uh, idea of the fate is that he is given because is considered as a sin in culture. And in my opinion, it was not in choice, but the inner conflict of the Igbo culture that dug its grave. When the root of culture, that is, uh, its fate is fragile, that is its choice. And uh, Okenko is uh, Okenko can be a classic hero in the classical sense of uh, tragic flow, the equation of manliness with rashness, anger and violence being about his own destruction. And Shino Achebe chose this title for the book from a uh, book uh, Things Fall Apart, that is the interview of Carol's code then literally fallen apart and it symbolically represents that Igbo society has fallen apart. Thus we can say the title is seeing this both the national identity is the both novels is the result of both into house from outside and community inside. Thank you. Well, thank you. Now, you. welcome. Uh, I look forward for any comments and questions. So, any questions? Just a second. Just a small so I question. Think 
yeah yes. that's a yes, yes. single question so as we talk about this thing um things fall apart and the sort of rootlessness that um was felt by the african youth of the of that particular culture because of the um colonialism so uh, is that uh, also a case that they were constantly trying to go back to the pre colonial time and that is why the ruthlessness came from isn't it a failed attempt as well no they are not trying to go back to their previous culture because they are already fed up with their culture and they want to uh, they want to abolish their uh, culture Th that is the deterioration of their national identity actually uh, after colonialism came after the christianity came they are actually dividing into two parts one of the igbo culture and one of uh, christianity and uh, many are supporting christianity because uh, they because of their practices they don't have any sacrifices like uh, the igbo igbo did earlier okay uh, thank you uh, i think uh, I would like to invite our next presenter, that is Ishan Mukhopadhyay, who is a PhD scholar in uh, IIT Kanpur. He will be presenting a paper called "A Post-Colonial and Eco-Critical Reading of Death Dark: The Heart of the Redness." So, over to you, Ishan. Hello. Hi. Uh, am I audible? Yes. 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 Hello. Yes. yes. All, all right. Uh, thank you for uh, calling me for presenting. I would like to share a screen. Yes. So, please let me know when that is visible. Okay. Is it visible? Not yet. Yes. Not yet. Yes, it's visible now. Now? Yes. Yes. Right. Thank you. So, uh, warm greetings to the respected members of the audience. Uh, my name is Ishan, and I would like to present a paper uh, called "The Postcolonial and Eco-Critical Reading of Zeke Sanders: The Heart of Redness." I am a PhD. I am about to start my PhD in IIT Kanpur. Right. So, the heart of redness. Uh, am I being perfectly audible, by the way? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. All right. Uh, the Heart of Redness by South African writer Zeke Semda is an important novel for post-colonial scholarship, among other reasons, because of the intertextual references it carries to Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness. The response to Conrad by Chinua Ashebe in An Image of Africa, Racism in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, is one of the breakthrough moments for the discipline of post-colonial studies. The novel depicts conflicts related to the themes of ecological conservation and economic development in the present day, but one finds that without a proper understanding of the village's colonial past, uh, indigenous traditions, and current challenges, it is impossible to reach a holistic solution. Emda is one in a long list of African writers and activists, such as Chinua Achebe, Ngogi Wa Thiongo, Kensa. Okay, you are not audible. Ishan Mukherjee, you are not audible. I think it's with some sort of technical glitch. Ishan Mukherjee, are you there? Hello. Hello. Not hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay. We have left the meeting. I think he will join soon. Okay. So. I think. Yes, left the meeting. Yes, um, but I think we'll join soon. Like, let's just wait for a minute, I guess. Yes. Yeah. 
some technical uh, yes i think it's something to do with yes he is is there is there yes hello yes uh yes am i back yes you are back and yeah, there was some disturbance with the network i'm yes. sorry yes you are audible uh, but okay the in no presentation is visible i like guess so my presentation is not visible right now no 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 presentation okay i will go back to the screen presentation no no yes thank you how about now mm, yes it's visible now all right can you please let me know where it was yes. that uh, i went off which I uh, till which place Okay, I'll just carry on. Uh, yes, I think that's fine. All right. Uh, Emda is one in a long list of African writers and activists, such as Chinua Ashabe, Ngogi Wa Thiongo, Kensaro Viva, and Wangari Mathai, who has spoken about the ongoing process of neo-colonialism in Africa and how land continues to be a potent site for social and environmental exploitation. So let me start with a brief summary of the story. The Heart of Redness depicts the struggles. of a local community in a small village called Koloha by Sea and Oswald British Colony located in South Africa they are embroiled in a debate about whether to support or resist the proposed development scheme of building a water park and a casino resort near the village the scheme will be undertaken by a big company that owns hotels throughout southern africa the supporters of the scheme are a group of people who call themselves unbelievers according to them this project will bring jobs street lights and other forms of modernization to this village the group of people that stands in opposition to this project call themselves believers the believers see the proposed project as something that will only harm the local people and environment according to them this project will bring affluence only to a handful of national elites even as it takes away from the villagers the access to their own land and resources the novel fo uh, focuses on how this form of development will benefit tourism but the but will be devastating for the local environment so that was the brief outline of the story so the key uh, uh, topics that i will be discussing in my paper are land as a site of power contestations the role of cartography in colonialism role of enclosures in neo colonialism uh, then ecological conservation in a present day african village and finally ecological in, uh, imperialism coming to the first topic land as a site of power contestations so robert p marzak in his book an ecological and post colonial study of literature writes about how land came to occupy an important space in colonial imagination it started with the enclosure movement in the 18th century england when the british parliament passed a law that made it mandatory for surrounding open lands with barriers designed to close off the free passage of people and animals an enclosure therefore is a system of turning land into private property it introduced concepts such as landlords and tenants moving away from older terminologies such as inhabitants it imposed on the surface of land a positivist ideology that saw it as a source of yielding surplus production and brought about a system of registration and ownership marzak writes and i quote the enclosure act involves the meticulous measurement of a piece of land for the first time by state land surveyors enabling portions of the land to become legally registered as separate private and thus positive properties this view of land uh, unquote this view of land as a, a commodity that is neatly registered and meant for high yield production is what the colonizers took to the territories they occupied where the site of wild unaccounted for landmass was a source of massive anxiety uh, coming to the role of cartography in the colonial process cartography was another important part of the of this civilizing mission as a tag given by the zosa people uh, by which the villagers were called uh, to sir george grey reveals he was mockingly known to the native people as the man who named 10 rivers mazek writes about this discursive aspect of enclosure quote one sign of this discursive development is the growing importance being given to the geographical metaphors around the time of the great waves of parliamentary acts of enclosure in the 18th century these terms reveal the rise of a discourse of enclosure and the extent to which this discourse saturates a developing geographical awareness scientifically politically aesthetically and mentally 
Michel Foucault discusses how terms such as these reflect a new administration of knowledge, disseminating effects of power along spatial lines. Alan Buell, uh, unquote, Alan Buell in his book, Nature's in Translation, writes about the role of cartography in ecological imperialism. I quote, a useful way of thinking about the colonial contestation of natures is provided by the idea of spatial history, the spatial forms and fantasies through which a culture declares its presence. Carter is interested in how physical spaces do not pre-exist, but instead are brought into being through spatial acts of writing and naming, choosing directions, applying, imagining goals, inhabiting the country." Unquote. Thus the act of naming rivers and landscapes and creating maps serves to create colonial discourses around nature that ties occupied parts of the earth in power relations with the empire. Coming to the role of enclosures in neocolonialism. The upcoming 21st century commercial venture of developing a water park and a casino near the village is a form of neocolonialism that threatens to damage the local ecosystem and the local way of life. Not only does Bonko and his circle of unbelievers think that the scheme will bring jobs and social infrastructure, but they also claim that it will help them progress from all that is primitive and wild. Uh, Marzak extends his interpretation of the role of enclosures on landscapes to such neocolonial initiatives when he writes, I quote, in the 21st century sphere of global world order, enclosures of a different kind continue, most notably the passage of transnational corporations into third world countries with the political economic organizations of the IMF and the World Bank setting the terms of development for these countries. With money as capital's general equivalent, its abstract axiomatic um, capital can be grafted upon any territory and upon any difference generated within a particular territory. In this sense, it can deterritorialize what was once intrinsic or peculiar to a territory, placing it within the universal flow of the global economy. He goes on to suggest that the logic of the high yield that stemmed from the enclosure philosophy is the same that is applied to the multi multinational corporates today in the name of economic development. Uh, um, so um, the author's response uh, to Conrad, um, Zex Emda's response to Conrad, uh, Conrad in this in this novel is in Koloha, the proposed project would have led to the benefit of influential elites and corporate bosses while leaving the poor villages behind. Not only do a section of the villagers support the project, but they also think that this will help get rid of their redness and bring modernity in its stead. Here, redness is a reference to all the ancient practices and customs and beliefs associated with the local community, which includes thaumaturgy, deep respect for dead ancestors, and the integration of folklore, flora, and fauna as a part of everyday culture. This redness is also an allusion to Conrad's darkness, where he referred to Africa as a continent of darkness, frenzy, and backwardness. In contrast, Emda's uh, redness is a site of tradition as well as modernity, a quality that roots them in ancient customs, as well as offers them the strength of identity in the face of modernization. However, uh, the impact of colonialism lies not only in the economy, not only in economy and ecology, but also in the minds of the colonized people, which is what makes the unbelievers led by Gonko despise their redness. And this is what Franz Fanon refers to as the psychological impact of colonialism. Okay, coming to the ecological conservation in the present day African village. The imagination of place in the heart of redness, uh, heart of redness, yes, carries elements of the local as well as the global. Nature conservation in the village of Koloha by sea has to take into consideration how colonialism has permanently altered the ecological landscape. So a modern day conservation project needs a rooted imagination, a sense of sustainability, as well as an active intervention. Notions of purity are distorted, not only with respect to identity and culture, but also with respect to nature. This is best exemplified by the actions of Hugh Kezwa, who, uh, who is a character, a woman character in the novel, who is put to trial by village elders for allegedly vandalizing the neighborhood flora. The village elders saw her act as a careless attack on nature. However, she was motivated to reduce the damage to local fauna by the foreign ones. I quote, part of her objection to the planned holiday paradise is that the natural beauty of Koloha by sea will be destroyed. But here she is standing before the graybeards of the village 
being charged with the serious crime of vandalizing trees, unquote. For most people, including Kamagu, all trees are part of a singular nature that must be protected. However, Kyukeswa defends herself in the trial by explaining that the wilderness has already been compromised by history and therefore modern conservation projects require human intervention. In the present day, the local flora includes various kinds of non-native plants that had been imported by the European colonists. Plants such as the lantana and ingberry present a threat to the native species. Many of these plants had been imported by the whites, but their progress had not been properly anticipated. Finally, coming to ecological imperialism, in Nature's in Translation, uh, Bewill writes, in his, I quote, in his groundbreaking work on the historical ecology of colonialism, Alfred W. Crosby has coined the term Colombian exchange to refer to the enormous globalized transference of biota that took place at the time. European settlers, he argues, did not travel alone, but brought with them their domestic animals, crops, weeds, pests, parasites, and diseases. Crosby's innovation lies in the argument that the success of the Europeans in settling the globe is not to be explained solely in terms of their technological domination over others, but also in terms of the biological success of the natures that they brought with them. The ground of expansion was laid not only by guns, warships, and information networks, but also, he suggests, by European germs, domesticated animals, and weeds. The sun may have set on the British empire of a global uh, sorry, on the British dream of a global empire, but it still never sets on the empire of the Dandelion. Long after the decline of the British empire, those who remain must still live with the new environments that were created by the expansionary diffusion of European natures across the globe." Unquote. The mobile natures carried across by the Europeans permanently contest with the local ecology, and it is this contestation that Kukeswa seeks to address as she demolishes invasive flora so that the local environment survives. Bevel continues, I quote, the goal is not simply to see natures in local terms as essentialized entities destroyed by the coming of the Europeans, but to understand how the local was being transformed by broader global forces to grasp the changes that took place in the very nature of places when the plants and animals that had originally composed them were replaced by others, unquote. In conclusion, the above arguments demonstrate that representations of place are always unstable, both because of a lack of homogeneity and because of the constant change over time. Therefore, notions of place and identity need to be seen as artificial constructions that are open to debate in order for effective protection of the local. Also, the imagination of land fueled by the enclosure movement that has come to be normalized in modern discourses of neocolonial projects needs to be re-examined. If one is to free the earth from unending tussles of power and wealth, one needs to be able to reimagine land in terms of its natural boundaries and not in terms of productivity and ownership alone. The discussions in this essay help in dismantling how traditions of thinking stemming from land enclosure uh, fueled colonial and neo-colonial endeavors in the South African village of Koloha by sea. Finally, these discussions also untangle how colonialism and neo-imperialism operate as much through displacement and exploitation of indigenous environments as through humans. Thank you, Ishan Mukhopadhyay, for this wonderful presentation and this wonderful paper on how um, we see boundaries of in our post-colonial time, globally. Uh, and I have this, um, not really a question, a comment uh, that is in great derangement, Amita Ugo said that um, it is the dream of a good life, the dream of a life with refrigerated TV and other um, electronic gadgets that was um, the, uh, sort of weaved in the mind of uh, the vast population of Asia that sort of um, worked as a catalyst uh, to this uh, deterioration of nature. So as you speak about this um, uh, the tussle between the believers and the non-believers, particularly uh, the non-believers um, um, A to um, willingness uh, for this project, if this reminds me of that. And I have one um, like 
not question. I would uh, like to know how would you connect this, uh, this colonial uh, impact on nature, particularly in places that were uh, particularly the continent that were colonized and also globally with this age of Anthropocene. We are in the age of Anthropocene and I think it has direct connection with the colonialism. So if you can elaborate that. Um, thank you for the question um, and the comment. Um, I think like when it comes to Anthropocene, typically Anthropocene talks about an era where uh, nature is sort of reimagined, right? It is an era where uh, humans have impacted and have intervened in nature to the extent that it, it's no longer the way that, let's say, the Holocene uh, you know, uh, had certain identification um, markers. So when it comes to the when it comes to nature and the specific role that that plays in the context of colonialism i would go to you know what alan buell uh, talks about in his natures of translation uh, sorry natures in translation uh, where he talks about how ecological imperialism plays a role in the colonization process in itself and uh, which involves like the all of the european people who went to the colonized uh, places bringing over their flora and fauna and displacing the indigenous uh, trees and the uh, you know the environment over there which continues to leave an impact to this date so even um, at this present time when there is this uh, uh, economic project or this development project that is about to happen you know there is this uh, context of using nature in a certain way that plays a part so yeah that's that's probably the role of nature that i would talk about and Anthropocene, I think, engages with the neo-colonization neo effort is as much as I can probably comment. Yes. Thank you for your uh, comment and the answer. I think um, I would like to uh, invite our next presenter, uh, Kothakuli Ghosh from uh, Postgraduate uh, Department of English, Rishi Bonkin Chandra College. She will be presenting a paper named The Impact of Slavery in Toni Morrison's Beloved. Over to you, Kotha Guli Ghosh. Am I visible and audible? Yes, you are both visible and audible. OK, so first of all, good evening, everybody. I am Kotha Guli Ghosh, and today I'm going to present my paper, which is titled as The Impact of Slavery on Toni Morrison's Beloved. So I'm proceeding with my presentation. Is my presentation visible? Not yet. None now? Uh, not yet. Ma'am, now? Yes, it's visible now. Okay, thank you. So, uh, this is the title of my paper, The Impact of Flavor in Tolly Morrison's Beloved. So, before I move into directly to my paper, I would like to give you a brief on the author. So, the author of the novel is Tony Morrison, whose original name is Chloe Anthony Wofford Morrison. She was born in February 18, 1931 in Lorraine, Ohio. She was an American writer who was noted for her examination of black experience within the black community. She even received the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1993. And her novels are known for their epic themes, brilliant languages. languages. So uh, this is the slide which consists of the works, famous works of her. So I'm going to talk about Beloved today. Now, let's get a brief about the novel. The novel is based on the true story of a runaway slave named Margaret Garner, who kills her daughter to present her from being subjected to the painful life of slavery. The book explores, uh, the novel is written just like Garner, the chief protagonist says, also kills her daughter and attempts to destroy her other children to prevent them from being recaptured as fugitives. The book explores the lives of slaves and her daughters after their escape from slavery. And uh, this, the book also, the book also explores the family relationships and also helps us to visualize the stress and the dismantlement of African American families 
under the virtual capture of slavery so the portrayal of slavery in the novel as you can see that sale is a female protagonist of the novel who was also a passionate devoted mother who underwent the painful journey of being a black slave and had to kill her daughter named beloved just to prevent her from being raptured as a recaptured as a fugitive now uh, the painful lives the portrayal of slavery has been in uh, has been portrayed in different segments like the most harrowing impact of slavery was that they were delineated from the they, they were denied the right to suckle their their children like the uh, slave women were not even recognized as mothers they were they were barred from participating in any of the social events they were even subjected to extreme torture they were subjected to oppression and exploitations as well they were not allowed to have any right to their family belongings even to their children now uh, say they also suffered a lot of brutal impact of slavery that is very beautifully portrayed in the uh, novel now through the novel we also get to see the evils of slavery like uh, we uh, we get to see that slavery was a case of extreme physical torture they were emotionally deprived they were spiritually deprived they were given a very dreadful life now uh, we know that slavery was prevalent in africa like for long years and it exists even today in some of the african countries the pain uh, the pain which was inflicted to slavery is very much portrayed throughout uh, in the novel like the novel the pain is universal because everyone involved in slavery was heavily scared heavily scarred in every way physically mentally sociologically or psychologically as well uh, slavery was uh, terrible for men but it was more terrible for women as well as it imposed harms on the families where men and women both were brutally treated mercilessly killed as well they were even exploited as i said so moving to the next slide so through this uh, uh, conclusion i would like to conclude that tony morrison has been best in documenting the brutal impact of slavery in in the novel beloved morrison has probed an insight into the lives of black female slaves who as slaves were destroyed dismantled abused and made victims of sexual and racial oppression by white people beloved shows us how the anti family system of slavery made it possible for the black family to play its role of import of imparting emotional and marital support and shape the identity of its member they were tortured they were deprived in beloved morrison probes deeper into the psychological effects of missing mother infant born and unearths the psychological damage and impact of slavery to the mother child relationship so that's all thank you it was a very quick presentation okay uh, thank you kothakuri ghosh for your presentation on the impact of slavery um since we started the entire uh, session on the question of motherhood and motherhood is one of the most important i think one of the most haunting uh, topic of beloved and uh, entire ujra of modesty so um do you think uh, here motherhood is also uh, sort of exploited for this um slave uh, for this in, uh, racial oppression and um, sort of uh, it is the woman's identity as mother and a woman's uh, determination not to uh, continue the slavery to get out of the symbolic order of slavery that is in, uh, in conflict here that is the problem here would you like to comment on that yeah uh, yes thank you ma'am for the question um yes uh, we can see through the character of said that she being a devoted passionate mother wanted to get uh, uh, wanted to fly away from the ruptures of slavery that dreadful experiences and in order to do that she what uh, she had only one option that is to kill her daughter because she didn't want her daughter beloved or any of her daughters to experience the harsh and brutal effect of slavery but she didn't have any other option but other than to kill her and she could only succeed killing beloved so uh, in this way we can see that through this um, uh, through slavery uh, seth has been uh, like she has been deprived from her motherly instinct she has been deprived from her motherhood she couldn't care is her, her child to grow up but she had to kill her because she wanted to protect her from the uh, brutal impact of slavery she didn't want her child to go through the pain which she went through 
Okay, thank you, Kothakuli, uh, for your answer. Um, any other questions from anyone or comment? Uh, I think not. Okay, so I invite our next presenter, uh, Kehin Samuel. Are you there, Mr. Samuel? Uh, I'm afraid not. Uh, no, I do not think Mr. Samuel is here. Uh, so we move on to our next presenter, that is Krishnendu B.S. Are you there, Krishnendu? Okay. So the next presenter is M. Aishwarya. Please respond if you are there, Aishwarya. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm here. Yes, yes. OK, so our next presenter is M. Aishwarya. She's an assistant professor of English uh, in GSS Jain College. Uh, her paper is titled The Twinship of Culture and Identity, Analyzing the Power of Oracle in Jennifer uh, Nansuba uh, Makumbi's Pink. Uh, please, uh, over to you, Ashwarya. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, shall I present? Uh... Yes, yes, please. Ma'am, is my screen visible? Yes, um, it is visible. OK. So a very good evening to everyone present here in the platform. So uh, the title of my paper is The Twinship of Culture and Identity, Analyzing the Power of Oracha in Jennifer Nansumba Makumbi's Chintu. So uh, this novel is written by Jennifer Makumbi. She is an Ugandan novelist and a short story writer. Um, in an interview, she has expressed her belief that there is a difference in reception of African text by a Western reader and by an African reader. But she was denied to pursue this idea in her doctoral studies because uh, she was studying in the West. So obviously, uh, something that is offensive to the West can't be taken in her studies. So uh, Aaron Body says in the introduction to this novel, Chintu, if you want to write about Africa, write about the legacies of colonial, colonialism. So if we take a closer look at the novels dealing with identity, we can see that the integral part of the plot will be either a, the effect of colonialism or uh, it's about the aftermath of colonialism. By doing so, uh, we, we succumb to the prescribed standards of the Eurocentric literature. So this novel breaks the standards of appealing to the Western audience. That's why this novel was initially denied publication because it was considered too African. So uh, this study analyzes the power of Oraicha and its uh, resilience to held generations over centuries. Uh, Chintu is actually a Ugandan mythical character who is considered to be the first human creation. So here in this novel, Chintu is represented as a general in a small town who marries the twin sisters. So it is uh, Ugandan belief that uh, separating twins is a sin. So he marries Nakato for love and Babri, her twin, for, pro for progeny because Nakato was unable to conceive. But when Bale, the heir of Nakato and uh, Chintu was born, the other kids loses their special treatment. So Chintu decided, decides to make Bale his legal heir Meanwhile, a man belonging to a different clan comes to uh, Chintu's province and uh, his name, uh, he comes with a son called Kalima and Chintu decides to take Kalima into his uh, own house because he is motherless. So Chintu is a very loving and uh, uh, generous uh, king, so he takes Kalima into his house. Uh, but then Kalima and Bale, they develop a very brotherly relationship and uh, they were considered to be non-biological twins. So, uh, but unfortunately on an occasion, when Chintu tried to chastise Kalima, he slaps him on his jaw and he falls dead. So Nitwa, uh, Twaya, the original father of uh, Kalima, he comes to know about uh, Chintu 
uh, accidentally killing Kalima, he uh, curses Chintu that all his descendants will die or they will suffer a very uh, tragic life. So then this novel shifts to the 21st century where we can see a grandmother telling the story of Chintu to her, uh, to her, uh, to, in her own version. Uh, she says, portraying Kintu as a savior of all descendants, protecting them from the wrath of Ntwaya. And uh, Ntwaya is referred to as the villain or the evil man. And in the latter part of the novel, where all the descendants, they come together to conduct a family reunion. They try to visit the land where Chintu was born and was ruling. But they were surprised to see that the villagers have the belief that Nakato, the wife of Chintu, is considered to be the guardian spirit of their village. It is surprising because the village where Chintu was born and was ruling is completely erased of the trace of Chintu and his memory. Rather, uh, they were prizing, they were worshipping Nakato's spirit. So these two versions uh, where we have one, Kin Chintu as the hero and Twire as the villain, and two, where we have Nakato being the guardian spirit shows us how Orecha or oral narratives can uh, take up different versions over the period of time. But the important thing to note here is its power to stand the traversity of time. It had the power to unite the descendants of Chintu despite them being separated by distance and time. So culture is another important aspect of this novel. Uh, the term culture has been derived from the Latin word cholerae which uh, I'm, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right or wrong, so which is related to something that is actively growing. Culture is never stagnant. It keeps evolving with time. Uh, in this novel, we come to know about a lot of Ugandan cultural beliefs and practices. Uh, for example, uh, Uganda was initially a very patriarchal nation. So for the first time, uh, Makumbi, she gives us a man's perspective about patriarchy. Chintu, who is uh, the general who is ruling over a kingdom, she, he is uh, talking about how he feels to be in this patriarchal world. So he says he feels like a seed dispenser. So it is common, uh, polygamy uh, is a common uh, thing, common cultural uh, custom in Uganda. But for a person who is in, in a throne, it was thrust upon him without his consent. He says he feels like a seed dispenser, but it was uh, common for women to feel like they were being treated as childbearing machines. But uh, Makumbi gives us a different perspective, a man's per perspective of being in a patriarchal uh, setup where he is forced to marry many wives and to uh, procreate as many children as possible. So another cultural belief here we have is nature being treated as a brother. So they believe that they share the resources with the wild. They always believe that nature is co uh, nature and human beings, they coexist with each other. So Chintu says, if you pick up a wild fruit, you must throw back some to the wild. So this is the belief that they had, sharing things with nature, with the wild. So when we travel back, uh, when we travel uh, in the, to the later part of the novel, where it uh, is, a, is the 21st century, we could see the same sentiment still prevailing among the villages. They say when we harvest, we leave behind half. So this shows the same cultural belief that was there in the 16th century. It still prevails in the 21st century of coexisting with nature. And uh, another uh, interesting, uh, there are many interesting cultural beliefs about uh, Uganda and their customs. We can see that the marriage rituals, we can see uh, marriage rituals like uh, dowry day or the ceremony where uh, married men come together to educate uh, the young groom about manhood and the life after marriage. So uh, about death, they believe that uh, if, the, if a person is not buried properly, their spirits will not leave the world. And also a person who commits suicide is... Uh, who, uh, who commits suicide doesn't deserve a burial. So culture and identity always coexist. So uh, this novel is filled with dualities, like the recurrence of the birth of twins in the descendants of Chintu from the beginning uh, till the end. Uh, there are many recurring births of twins in the descendants of Chintu. 
and also the dual identity of the characters the duality between past and the present the ugandan and the christian so it is the whole novel is filled with dualities or uh, the twinship of culture and identity is visible all over the novel and it is also important to note that all the characters in this novel has a ugandan name and also a christian name so this novel itself is a hybrid of uh, ugandan uh, myth of creation of chintu chintu who is uh, the first man of uh, god's creation and about and a mingling of the christian myth of the curse of ham so uh, makumbi has combined these two uh, myths to uh, form this uh, novel and it is an ugandan belief that separating the twins is a sin if a twin dies the other will also die so uh, separating sin uh, se- separating the twins is considered to be a sin and uh, the twins were considered to be a single person or a single soul so this novel deals with the four different descendants of chintu and how the curse befalls them so first we have subi uh, who is a girl in her mid 20s who uh, ha- who's also had a twin but she uh, loses her twin in her early childhood but she keeps hearing the twin's voice and she keeps denying uh, the twin's existence she is in a deep rejection of her identity uh even though she is well ab- uh even though she is well aware about her roots she refuses to expose her identity uh rather than rather she creates uh, imaginative stories like she say, she'll say that her parents are from london and uh, she says they are very rich and uh, she, they are providing her with uh, things but she refuses to uh, accept the reality that she had no parents and later when she grew up uh she tries to change her name after mr kiyaga uh in whose house she works as a maid so this shows uh, she also calls him daddy and uh, this shows how uh, disoriented her identity is she is frequently visited by the image of uh, her twin who is asking her to tell tell the truth about her identity to everyone she threatens her in her dreams to tell about tell the truth about her identity she uh, uh subi she even sometimes talks and behaves like a twin and this shows her rejection about her identity has created a split personality in her uh when the uh, descendants they try to ca- conduct a reunion in order to uh, get rid of this uh, curse that has befallen the entire descendant of chintu so during that uh, during that ceremony she is forced to face the reality of her real identity so it is at that point she confronts her reality and accepts her true self she also confronts uh, that she had a twin that she was entirely um, lying the whole time and everyone accepts her and at the end and she also accepts her true self and the second uh, uh, character we have is kanani chintu so Ch- uh, kanani chintu uh, he come he uh, believes in the christian ideology of being awakened uh, awakened is a sect of uh, christianity that developed during that time where they believed that uh, where they believed in extreme christian beliefs where they considered everything to be sin where they considered confessing is the only way to uh, heaven so kanani chintu she he believes in complete christian ideologies and he completely rejects his ugandan cultural ideals so he dedicates his entire life he's a old man in his uh, 70s so he dedicated his whole life in uh, confessing uh, in uh, conducting sermons about the christian uh, importance of confessing and to enter heaven so it uh, this family reunion where every descendant they uh, try to come together and to uh, uh, take away the curse kanani kintu realizes that he had been lying to him the whole, lying, lying to himself the whole time so he also recognizes uh, the importance of his cultural persona and he accepts his identity so then we have isaac newton chintu so he was born out of an unconsensual unconsensual sex of his mother and her father mr puti kintu so he was neglected as a child and was ill treated because of his physical appearance and uh, as a coping mechanism for his loneliness he um, he has created many imaginative friends like he calls snakes worms and leaves as, as his friends but 
he excels in education which brings him up in his uh, life he loses his wife to a deadly disease but he assumes that he, uh, it was him who has given her hiv and he doubts that his child must also uh, have contracted the disease from the mother but he doesn't consult a doctor but he says i don't expect you to understand i don't want the certainty that you want in my mind i am certain that i have it but in my mind i am also certain that i don't don't take away don't take my doubt away his inability to settle his ability to certain for uncertainty shows that he is unable to come to terms with reality he he refuses to open the hiv test results uh but after the family uh, union he meets with an accident but fortunately he survives he believes that it was the ritual that has saved him so uh at the end he uh opens the hiv test result and he finds it to be negative so uh thus his troubled conscience has relieved of guilt and he develops a new positivity towards life uh and the last and most important uh descendant of chin to is missy the elder of the clan and he has suffered a childhood a trauma of uh, his father himself sacrificing his brother so but missy he has repressed this memory which has led to his delusional dreams he constantly gets delusional dreams and uh, his inability to confront his traumatic past has made him ignorant of his roots during his youth he is believed that uh, the west is the land of humanity but only later he understands that the colonialists had invented a uh perpetuated a pseudo savior persona which they wore for the colonies while back home they were a different person he uh, neither believes in the western culture nor in his ugandan culture he lives his life as a non believer repressing his childhood trauma uh he becomes the reason for initiating this family reunion as the elder of the clan but the reunion which had brought hope in the life of the other characters happens to be fatalistic for missy his only surviving son kamu kinchintu he dies of an unjust death in the hands of an angry mob um, so after his son's death uh, missy becomes insane after uh, this, the death of his son and uh, at the end missy who was a highly learned man had become someone who is unable to differentiate reality and delusion so we uh, through all uh the four descendants the common thing that we can see is their uh, uh mel- uh kind of mental illness that is persuading uh, that that is uh, common in all four of them so uh i would like to conclude by saying that if the uh, if the curse had the power of persisting through various generation the orator of chintu also had persisted so while looking at the family reunion in a psychological perspective it has served as a space for the characters to confront their fear repression and denial of their cultural roots thus by con- confronting it they are resolved of their sufferings if it is taken literally as a ritual it has proved fruitful in bringing positivity in lives of the many characters thank you thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you, sir. Uh, thank you sir. any more questions here well we do well we look forward to uh, any more questions so anyone who will ask question okay then we will uh, invite our next uh, participant this is m shubhasti m shubhasti is there yes i am online can you hear me well Yes, yes. Yes, no problem. Yeah, uh, shall I present now? I have a PPT. Yes, uh, please present the paper. Uh, you will be presenting the rhythm of identity, a study of the African drum as a symbol of identity in Gabriel Okara's poem, The Mystic Drum. Over to you, Shubhasri. Uh, thank you. Please start the presentation. Is it visible? Um, is no. the ppt now now 
is it visible now yes it is visible Hello? now okay. yes it is visible now. Yeah. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, um, thank you for giving the opportunity. Uh, so, my paper is titled "The Rhythm of Identity: A Study of the African Drum as a Symbol of Identity" in Gabriel Okara's poem, "The Mystic Drum." So, uh, the African drum uh, occupies a very important uh, space in the African tradition. It is seen as a cultural and spiritual symbol. Uh, Okara's um, picturization of the drum as a cultural symbol um, is obviously it is inherited. Uh, it is a, a, an inherited cultural knowledge of his because Okara was a Nigerian poet, uh, of course, uh, through the cultural propagation that is done by his community. Um, he must have known about his culture, all the symbols relating to his culture, the music of his culture. Um, through his uh, community people, through his family, through his upbringing. Whereas uh, the individual perception of the drum of Okara is quite different from uh, what the general, uh, what the uh, community has, uh, I mean, what the uh, symbol of drum means to the community, uh, which takes us to, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have to consider Obi Marikor's uh, uh, differentiation of myth versus mysticism. So, uh, Obi Madakar says that uh, myth refers to the sum total of organized cultural beliefs and norms that sustain a writer's imagination. When those beliefs and values are made to become personal, personal symbols, we move into the area of mysticism. So, uh, what Okara's cultural knowledge, uh, I mean, Okara's cultural knowledge is based on the myths that has been passed or that he inherited from uh, his uh, members in the family or in the community. Whereas his individual perception is the way he understood, understands it and how he tries to use the drum as a, um, as a vehicle to his mystic insight, that is for his own uh, creation of his mystic world. Now moving on to uh, the making and the instrumentation of the drum. So the drum, the African drum, um, I mean, there are many different types of African drums. Um, most all of these drums are made purely from nature. So um, in fact, uh, the making of the drum itself involves a lot of processes, starting from uh, cutting off the African hardwood to procuring animal skins for making the membranes of the drum. Uh, there are so many rituals that uh, are done in each of the each and every of these processes. Uh, so they would, uh, of course, do a sacrificial ritual because they believe that all the trees, um, animals in the entire earth um, is a living spirit. It's not, um, uh, you know, unlike the Western concept where uh, uh, you know, uh, animals and uh, other elements of nature apart from humans are considered as, uh, you know, um, unintelligent uh, beings. Whereas uh, African um, visualization of the uh, world is um, in terms of spiritualism, that they see that the spirit, uh, I mean, every element of nature has a certain spirit and and uh, so the cutting of the trees or uh, procuring the animal skin, of course, would uh, you know, they would invoke the spirit of the trees or the animals and uh, then they pay worship uh, and they thank the spirits so that uh, they could get the material for the drum making. And uh, now once the drum is made, it is handed over to the communities for cultural propagation. Now, uh, the drumming performance uh, itself, um, you know, the, all, all of these drumming performance contains a song that uh, si that sings about uh, the culture of the community, the history of that culture, folklore, folk tales. All of these things, uh, what we call as the repertoire of culture, is being um, you know uh, propagated through these drumming performances. Now, A. M. Jones says, uh, coming to the instrumentation of the drum, A. M. Jones says that drumming is the heart of African music. Now. Uh, this is because uh, in most of the musical performances, especially of the Western musical tradition, we find that the musical performance starts with the uh, voice of the singer as the initiating point. That is, once when the uh, 
you know the start of the vocal performance marks the starting of the entire performance itself but here the build up of the rhythm of the drum makes the uh, start starting point or it is the initiator for all the performances in uh, african musical tradition so without a drum there is almost no african music because they believe that the drum uh, is uh, you know it, it is very close to them uh, not only because it is um, culturally very important and uh, that drum is made specifically in africa but also they attribute spiritual powers to the drum and uh, so when we talk about spiritual powers of the drum um, we also have to note another important aspect of the drum's instrumentation which is uh, the clash of the rhythms so uh, in a very uh, typical african drumming performance we have uh, not just one drum but several drums almost like three or four drums playing simultaneously but each in a different rhythm uh, accompanying uh, this rhythm of the drums there are also several other um, uh, you know uh, ways of creating the rhythm uh, for example uh, every drumming performance takes place with a group of people around and uh, they start hand clapping or sometimes they start uh, stick beating or whatever the uh, you know uh, everyday um, activities they are doing uh, they start making music with that like simply um, you know uh, if they are supposedly uh, thrashing maize or uh, grinding something on a mortar and a pestle they start making sounds with that and that's how the rhythm is being built so music for african communities is not a very it's not something that is taken out of life or merely aesthetic performance but it is a natural everyday way of living coming to the performance and uh, spirituality aspect uh, so uh, performance uh, the drumming performance includes a song um, every song narrates a uh, a folk lore just like i already mentioned it's it's uh, is essentially uh, telling of folklores or uh, maybe history of the community itself or even uh, the drum also plays a very important role in the in partaking uh, in the life incidents of the uh, people in the community for example if someone in the community uh, you know there is a, a birth ceremony or there is a funeral uh, that's taking place or someone's marriage is taking place in the community the drumming performance is a mandatory one so uh, so which means the drum and the african community are so close and intricate to each other um and uh, another thing to note uh, here is that um the drumming performance actually um you know as i said already the uh, there is a song that is accompanying the drumming performance uh, here there is not there is no much of importance to the vocal proficiency of the singer nobody is going to uh, judge the singer of how well they sing because the song is uh, specifically constructed for the message that it delivers the message is of course the propagation of culture that is folk tales folk lore all of this so motive profundity uh, occupies the forefront compared to the vocal proficiency of the singer now um the uh, spiritual aspect uh, i mean sorry the performance involves all the members of the community now anybody can participate in that storytelling performance so which means it's a very interactive community building process uh, nobody is left out anybody is uh, there is no clear cut differentiation between the performers and the audience because it is performed in the community so as much as the community comes together to uh, create the performance it is also the performance that binds to, binds them as a single community because it tells the tales it's it, like uh, it is a center of cultural propagation so the people start identifying themselves more and more with the um, you know the come the uh, roots that they come from so the sense of belongingness is built in such a performance now um then say we uh, categorizes the drumming performance into three uh, you know in, into uh, three divisions so first uh, the song that uh, you know that uh, tells the folk tales or folklore it he calls it as a vocal processing of the language 
and drumming is seen as an instrumental processing of the language dance is seen as a choreographical uh, choreographical processing of the language so these three elements are very uh, important and they are significant to every drumming performance and all of these three are necessary for the meaning making process that has to happen through the drum um, so uh, this creates the drum dialogue which means that the, uh, they all uh, Afri for african communities the drum is not just a musical instrument but they call it as a talking drum which means the drum talks they connect to it very spiritually and uh, because it is only with the help of the drum that they are able to uh, you know uh, teach or impart their cultural richness to the next generations which means it's a very crucial part of community building and um, that happens through these three uh, pro uh, processing of language that is the song drumming and dance where the drumming is the starting point for all of these other uh, processing of language so and another thing is uh, drum this drum culture itself is a knowledge that they have got from uh, the culture that is propagated through a performance um, that was you know done by the previous generations so the present culture for example the present uh, african culture would have known about the drum by uh, through their uh, you know previous generations so the drum can drum is both the product as well as the initiator of the uh, culture that is propagated through the performance now um, and that is why gabriel lucara uh, sees that the drum um, actually uh, the drum is that's why Gabriel Lakara uh, gives so much of importance to the drum because he thinks that the drum is, is his source of inspiration. It is the point or it is a symbol of his own creation because he the drum helps him to reminisce about his uh, native roots and he is more uh, you know uh, uh, he is able to get into the mystic side which is inside himself through the help of the drum, um, the image of the drum. Now, uh, performance and identity construction. So this go uh, hand in hand. Uh, Simon Fritz says that um, identity is a mobile process. It's it's a mobile thing. It's not a process. It's a process, not a thing. Uh, it's a becoming, not a being. So um, identity is something that uh, is always in process. Um, same way, uh, the drumming itself is always a process. Um, you know, it, uh, like I already mentioned, the cultural propagation uh, happens within the drumming performance and it keeps uh, telling and reminding the people where they come from uh, or sometimes if new members are uh, coming into the community, they enlighten them about the culture that they are, uh, the, uh, that they are um, you know, uh, visualizing through the drumming performance. So um, they, this helps them, uh, this helps the community people to get uh, to you know, remind themselves of the roles that they have to perform. Uh, for example, if they belong to a Yoruba community, the, the drumming performance would often uh, would uh, you know propagate tales of the community so that they understand their roots and they understand where they come from. So they perform their roles as the members of the community because identity itself is a performance. It keep, uh, we are conditioned to certain uh, criteria and we try to understand them and try to perform the roles uh, that these conditions uh, you know give to us so drumming performance can uh, itself be seen as a metaphor of identity identification now um, okay so um, the uh, question now the question is um, the sense of belongingness community build, uh, community building all of this can, could uh, you know very easily be uh, transmitted to the next generation or the other community people through normal uh, human origins. Now, what what is the need for uh, you know a, a drumming performance uh, to come in, and why should cultural propagation take place in such a atmosphere, such a atmosphere where uh, you know a metalingual atmosphere? Um, the reason is the performers who are involved in the uh, in, in the drumming. Uh, some of the performers are uh, they get into a trance like I already mentioned there is a clash of rhythms that uh, these uh, drums create uh, because there are so many other so many drums 
the simultaneous build up of the drum uh, you know uh, causes one of one or two of the performers or sometimes even the onlookers to get into a trance and so uh, as they get into a trance they become or they are considered as uh, the superhuman voices of the spirits of their ancestors so which means that whatever the, the words that they utter uh, the inspired the words of the uh, inspired performer uh, is uh, becomes a holy mandate that is nobody can challenge that challenge them or no there is no dialogue it's, it becomes a dialectic so um, this is the point where the laws of the community are made because these performers they become uh, the voices of the spirits and who are revered in the african communities so uh, the the uh, entire dramatic performance itself becomes a um you know law making or a um, you know agenda setting or uh, performance so that is why that is more close to the african culture um so and that is the need why uh, a performance like uh, you know uh, a drumming performance has to uh, is is um, adopted for cultural propagation than just uh, you know uh, tell tales in the normal human voice so again this becomes a process of identity construction now uh, coming back to the poem uh, of okara uh, the the female uh, okara keeps mentioning the female figure uh, in the poem so uh, according to him the female figure can ma'am would you please wrap yeah. up uh, the female figure is seen as a symbol of western influence um the um you know she uh, she keeps uh, Uh, she keeps seeing the performance but yet refuses to participate now um, okara's poetry always uh, consists of this um, you know dilemma where he is uh, finding it unable to balance the traditional and the modern which is uh, the same thing that uh, many of the presenters also mentioned um so <laughs> the woman uh, can also be seen as a uh, the symbol of or an agent of cultural appropriation where the drum is now taken as in the globalized world the drum is now taken as uh, um uh, you know uh, uh taken to be uh, uh is adapted to um in in uh, some, several um, multinational corporations like in govinda's article uh, he says uh, the drum is used as a means for facilitating interactive team building within organizations so as to enhance group dynamics and build team spirit so the drumming performance ma'am would you please wrap up just just two seconds um so in a globalized world it becomes very uh, hard for the people to understand the other uh, world, other communities of the world to understand the true essence and morals of the african culture so that this okara's fear and rejection um and yeah, that is represented in the book thank you okay thank you uh, thank you yes um thank you for such a sonorous paper on the significance of drum in african culture in context of gabriel okara's poem i do not think we have time for taking question or comments now so i am skipping this if any of you have any question please hold on to it and we can take it at the end uh, so i quickly invite uh maha uh, madhakari nayaka assistant professor department of studies in english uh, davangri university karnatak uh, sh- um, to present the paper representation of reality in the cherry alu alu for stick fighting days yes yes madam shala shala yes please may audible to you yes you are yeah. on yeah. so so yes, shall yes. i pr- present my paper madam Yes, ma'am. Uh, please. Sir. Okay, I don't have any slide shows. Just direct. I will go to reroute. Okay, so it will be okay, an ma'am. audio presentation only. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So myself, uh, Madhav Karanai, I am assistant professor from Karnataka. So my paper is representation of reality okay. in uh, Terry Ulfemi's short story Stick Fighting Days. Ah, uh, so here. so one of the uh, studies of aesthetics has been the contradictions of the colonialist definition of african aesthetics a particular area of discourse has been negative analysis of african art such as uh, the claim that the category of realism does not to african art one of the thinker william abram argues that 
when critics like uh, Gobrich uh, says that the African artists were incapable of uh, realistic representation. They quite uh, miss the point of African art. If they seek lifelike representation, they should turn to secular art, the art which was uh, produced for decorative purpose or uh, the purpose of record rather than the moral art, the art whose inspiration is intuition of world force. So like that, uh, uh, world, uh, African art, keep on make uh, here, uh, I, I hypothesize about the uh, general characters of African heart. Abram observes the Ashanti wooden maiden, which uh, optimize, uh, epitomize the Ashanti ideal of female beauty, were responsible uh, lifelike, thus signifying that the African art is both realistic and figurative, depending on its uh, specific social justifications. In Terry Wolfemish's uh, story, Stick Fighting Death, which is the, the first Sierra Leonean to win the Kane Prize for African writing. A story set on a garbage dump follows two boys and their survival in poverty upon the rubbish heap. Here he recognizes African real trends. Those are identified and discussed. His willingness is to explore issues and the field of experiences previously marginalized are considered taboo, especially in the realm of African diaspora. His objections speak to widespread global call for the decolonization of in, uh, institutionalized cultures. One element of this Africanization debate involves assessing the value of contemporary literature written by Africans who lives in diasporas. So then who is Wolfemi? Wolfemi was born in Sierra Leone of African and anti leonian parentage. He grew up in Nigeria, UK, and Ivory Coast before attending New York University. So where he, uh, where he uh, earned a bachelor uh, uh, in creative writing. Subsequently, Wolfemi lived in Kenya and worked as a journalist and analyst in Somalia and Uganda. He lives in Cape Town, where he uh, his writing is first novel. His writing as uh, engaged uh, appears or appeared in the uh, Chimuranga Chronicle magazine. He describes in, himself as a practicing applied art, suggesting that realism is also a politically committed and a transformative form of, as opposed to the tradition of art for art's sake. It is this concern with historical and sociological reality that makes African literature a more accurate and extensive account of uh, contemporary African reality than sociological or political document. So in stories, Thick Fighting Days is a writer of Ulfemi Terry's second story. This is the story of a young boy growing up in a Nigeria that the writer describes with a fondness and a keen familiarity. The story is filled with blood, shit, murder, glue sniffing, scavenging, and more things All, at almost every other line. So there is the macabre. There is enough macabre in this story. Ulfemi's story is most of a representation of is African reality, partially what, what he wants to portray as to which reality. Reality uh, based on his perception or his personal experience, it is up to him to tell us. It is the story about a young boy, 13 years, named Raoul, the life he leads. We do not know the place when you're going to read the uh, story, where it's a town or a city. The story is based on character Raoul and how he relates his uh, environment and the people around him. Raul is a stick fighter in the story. He fights with the sticks. Uh, what is stick fighting? It is a traditional martial game among black youth, especially in rural area in Africa. Involving here, involving two bar, uh, fighters, each wielding two sticks, uh, the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. So this is not a child game. He fights to kill. He pops out eyes of opposite fighters. In fact, in a single day, he killed two people, a boy named Tauzin from who steals bread. 
and Sala, a guy who always act judge during fighting. He makes killing as a profession for survival. This makes the reader wonder how many people would be left out on the street if he goes on doing like this. Besides, he exhibits no emotions and feelings while killing the people, which makes the reader bizarre by reading the story. So one of the line in this uh, story, is, there is something in his eyes. He is not afraid, but I see recognition beyond fear and acceptance of what I am about to do, of what I am killing. So the story in the first person narrative, this is how Raoul describes killing Tauzin. The strike is precise enough to kill. I feel the rubbery give of his temple beneath the tip of my stick. But once more shame comes on me, so suddenly I taste it, mingling with the acid vomit. I walk away without checking his death. This is the length of the story. So this is the 13-year-old boy who named Styx, Mar Miguel and Arthurist, because the dead salad had told him stories from the Lord of the Ring. In fact, he aims to be like the Spartan. And here the Ulfemi show his motives to create a morbid and a macabre story in a, in a way that he has never been before. For how does an illiterate boy who does nothing but to fight, kill, scavenge and sniff got to know how the Spartans were and wanted to be like them. It's almost like a collection of morbidity heaped on the role character. So here uh, in this story, there is a close relationship between events and the story is questions about citizenship, cultural identity, national literature, African reality. He considers such an effort universalizing suspicious gambit which makes the obliterations of third world national narratives and the appropriation of these narratives in the course of post-industrial quest for a global unident um, and uh, guilt-free discourses, all embracing view or representations of Nigerian real national culture, especially due to exile, diaspora, migration, cosmopolitan. African writers like him taking their cue from real life use the beauty to help communicate important truth and information to the society. The main theme in African literature like uh, Ulfemi, colonialism, subjugation, nationalism, cultural contact, and conflict and alienation, and also disillusionment, and most recently, gender, homosexuality, poverty, porn, and modernity. So African literature is concerned, Achibe, regarded as the inventor of African literature. Their self apprehension might not be as complicated as that of self exiled Ben of in Arcadia, an example of a new age phase in his writing. Nevertheless, the lived experience and cultural identities are, identities are likely to be more complex compared to that of writers who never left Nigeria, such as Tracia Nomambi and Chipo Hunger and Sefi Atta. So these are the writers. A proof of this can be gleaned from text cultural atmosphere. So African literature can also part into critical realism and social realism. The first, which is evident in the work of Chinua Chibe, Wolesa Inka, and of other, and of other African contemporary writers like Uzdinma Iviala and uh, Noviole Buluvio and uh, Tendai Hucho. These are all contemporary writers. These writers are principally characterized by an uh, accurate description of condition of modern Africa, but without preferring a clear solution to the problem identified, Kwame Afaya, the, is a British Ghanaian philosopher, cultural thinker, argued that realism is the artistic expression of African national ideology and is thus complicit with the nationalism, superficial resolution of the underlying difficulties uh, facing Africa. Therefore, African literature is indeed a never-ending effort on the part of writers to recover African true character and place in human history. It aims at uh, restoring the African past from the era of European integration, subjugation, and domination. The crippling impact of European colonial domination and imperialist exploitations 
had damaged and ruptured the African socio-political cultural landscape to a considerable extent. And as a matter of fact, it became a primary concern for the African writer to grapple with these fundamental African realities. The important here is that the linguistic and traditional notions about the Nigerian canon based on the national outlook embrace extra nationality. Moreover, the question of ancestry or roots, even in the face of adoptive citizenship, migrancy, diaspora, or exile, how to be applicable to uh, art articulations about national canon, irrespective, irrespective of writers' ideological partiality. For example, T.S. Eliot's adoption of British citizenship cannot erase the fact of he is also having been an American. So I want to conclude. So I think one of the deeper aspect of this story, uh, very well done, a sense that Rahul uh, and his fellow stick fighter are descendant of one proud warriors who were the creator of strong cultural tradition in which one could take pride. Proud warriors no more. They are considered old at 17th century. And violent capitulous and will find most of them. I do not want to give away ending of stick fighting days, but it is it was very well done, exciting, very cinematic in realization and more than a little shock. The language is very simple and very direct one. So the we feel a sense of loss when you realize that all of the characters in this story and their real life models will probably end up with a short point like life. Thank you, madam. Hello. Hello. Hello, may I audible? Yes, you're on. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, madam, thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, sir, for the wonderful paper on the realism of Africa, uh, uh, like how um, the realism the, of modern Africa is captured. I yes, have one thing to ask you that is uh, when you say that there is this aesthetic assumption that African art is not uh, reali realism is not really the main concern of African art and you are saying that it is the colonial assumption. So uh, is it that, that it was or can it be a way to um, sort of deny the reality like so that we assign certain amount of uh, not so realistic identity to African art and look at it always symbolically uh, because symbolism always gives you the opportunity to interpret rather than just being direct on your face. So is it so? Is it a colonial way of cultural um, appropriation for the way yes, of, yes, so I was uh, thinking of that. Yes, madam, I thought you told exactly right, madam. So in, uh, in, uh... Uh, European notion about African or any third world countries about uh, they don't they don't uh, represent uh, the writing a real art so what uh, uh, European always felt the writer so but when we observe going when we going to observe the book of Akiyangu or uh, Chinuachi they and the contemporary writers like uh, Ulfemi they want to represent their real Africa their real uh, Africa in their writing so in the uh, Beginning uh, in once in his uh, in his meeting he told that uh, I don't want to be a, a representative of art for art sake I want to represent a real Africa so what was uh, 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 in his writing we may observe. Yes, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from anyone? Okay. I uh, think we should uh, move on to our next presentation. Uh, I invite uh, Professor uh, Mad uh, Madhalana Saila Prasad. Uh, forgive me if I have spelled your name, uh, pronounced your name a bit wrong. He's an assistant professor in the Department of English, Badruka College of Commerce and Art, um, Hyderabad, Telangana. Uh, he will be presenting the paper, African Literary Themes in Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Over to you, sir. Please. Thank you. Sir, you have switched yeah, off yeah. your audio, yes. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, African Literary Themes in Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Myself, I am 
Madanala Shaila Prasad, Assistant Professor in English Department, Badruka College of Commerce and Arts. And uh, when we talk about Africans, right, Africans, there is a key role played by Ralpha Elations in his writing Invisible Man. And here uh, in, my, uh, in my talk, what I am going to focus on that, the major themes, what actually the Africans, actually earlier speaker who has presented in uh, that one, he covered everything. So let me go ahead. All major writers focused, African, uh, whatever the writers, either they're from the diaspora perspective or from the outside or inner side, everybody, they have focused on some of the common, uh, common areas or themes they have. Like all the major writers focused on seven conflicts as their major themes. According to Ali, A. Muzari and other, the clash between African past and present, between tradition and modernity, between indigenous and foreign, between individualism as a community, and between socialism and capitalism, between development and self-reliance, and between Africanity and humanity. So these are the some of the themes. And when it comes on to Ralph Eilishan, why I have chosen this one is that this is a novel is a, a contemporary one when we can say that 1952 and the most of the African countries, most of the African countries, they have got their independence. They have got their independence either in the close to the 1950s or 60s. And in such a scenario, when this Ralph Eilishan has published his book in 1952 and he's been the grandson of a slave. So he has got much association with the living styles as well as the, the modernity of, or the uh, what kind of atmosphere they have been brought up. Right? So here when we talk about African past and present, African past and present, in the past, I would like to quote here uh, how the past they have contributed for the nation building. One of the major points where we could uh, see that is from uh, in the one of the, the character, the character grandfather, the character grandfather, he says that invisible man's grandfather, here it, uh, why I have chosen the grandfather topic over here is that he talks about the African past, where he says that he served for the country, he served for the country for decades ago. As we could see the same thing in uh, I have a dream, I have a dream from Martin Luther King, where he quotes such, quote, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the life of the is still sadly crippled by the maniacal of surgeons and the claim chain discrimination. 100 years later, the Negroes lives on a lonely island of poverty in midst of vast ocean of materialistic prosperity. These were the words said by the Martin Luther King and the same correlated the topic which is covered by Invisible Man in Grandfather Stark, where he also confesses or he also says the same thing. And when we look at the Invisible Man, the writer Alpha Inishan, Ralph Elation is not giving any clear cut instructions. He is giving the, he left the entire novel with an open ended where the, each one can interpret their own, give conclusions by their own understandings. So here, when we look at the grandfather says to uh, the death in the deathbed, when he is on deathbed, he calls his son, that is narrator's father and says that son, I quote, son, after I am gone, I want you to keep up the good fight. I never told you, but our life is a war. And I have been traitor all my born days. I spy of enemy country ever since I gave up my gun back and reconstruction. Live with your head in lion's mouth. So these are the lines which symbolizes the same meaning of what uh, in relation wanted to say, tell, tell about at the same time with Martin Luther King. This is all represents about the past of the uh, past of the African countries and how they were lived. And then when we talk about in when we talk about the Ralph with this main story where the invisible character, right? He didn't even take up the name for a sake, right? And what he says as a child when he grown up and he becomes a good orator and at his school premises and at his higher studies, in one of the oration, he says that instead of saying that he says that social equality instead of social responsibility. And that has made uh, uh, his life uh, go into the worst. And to that, that leads to him to be one of the, I see the eye of the white people, where the I, white people, what they wanted, uh, they wanted the blacks to suffer. So here in this one also, what happened, the trustee who 
actually who takes the trust who takes the trust and who so takes the invisible man into confidence and saying that i will be patting up you and i will encourage you in all the way and at the last what he has done he has given seven letters of recommendations and in that recommendation the recommendations were false one and what it is revealed it is that it is written as quote to whom it may concern i intone keep this nigger boy running so here what happened the whites always the white people the colonial ruling are the earlier what happened these people tried to dominate and these people tried to take up the trust of the black people and they tried to keep this blacks to suffer so that is about past and in the in the even the present also the same and when it is comes on to the one of the trustee when he has given the seven letters and he goes all the way and when his identity those i letters identity is proved that is they are of false he takes help of one of the trustee's son and he joins in the painting liberty painting where in where the it is known popularly for making a white paint of good quality and here what is the significance of this painting is royal this painting is that this painting is made made up of black and white and the way they are known for the making of white paint which is popularly known and the white paint is but done based on the uh, hard work which is rendered by the black people as well as white and output comes as a white paint so here what actually the invisible man he wanted to tell that the white their identity always lies with the hard work and hardships which they have rendered and what happened here when they in one of the battle internal fight among themselves there is a, a blast happens and uh, the, he was admitted into the hospital there also what happened the invisible man was used as an experiment tool for the by the one of the doctor by one of the doctor he uses the person as a as a tool right and he wanted to do some of the research on his body right this is one area so here this is all the way and when it comes on to if we compare if we compare the grandson grandfather what he said to him he didn't trust until unless he experienced some of the individual his identity within the community and outside the community when his identity was revealed within the community and identity when in the very beginning when his grandfather was saying all these things he didn't believe but when it comes on to his life and even uh, the topic when we talk about invisible man he likes to he goes as underground or else he hides himself from the society and what he says here his identity is uh, kept in hidden not because of he is not physically present because of people started not looking at him so these are the some of the uh, degraded deprived situations of the invisible man where actually the grandfather made him raise several reminders that these white people were cheated and everything and what he wanted he wanted the, his son as well as the next uh, uh, way to come they all to fight against to the white people for their rights and what he says that uh, let it uh, to be vomit out till the he uses one of the phrase that is uh, to uh, let them to be vomit out and if you look at these uh, the white people that is cyber one of the character right who uses him as an as an sexual right to uh, to yeah cyber she uses a fulfill her sexual desire so here it is one more aspect what he wanted to tell is that even the black people were used by the whites as say, to fulfill their sexual desire and see throughout the throughout this what are the things that comes in uh, uh topic is that the themes all the themes which are covered by the african identity those all things covered by the invisible man by ralph elishan and thank you could you able to hear me ma'am yes yeah thank you thank you yes sir so okay. any more questions yes. here anyone wants to question well then uh, we should proceed anyone has any question uh, thank you sir for such an illuminating paper 
on African literary themes in the Invisible Man. I think we can discuss some of the questions together at the end, if anyone has that. So let us quickly move on to the next presenter. That is Mahima Kashyap. I invite uh, Mahima Kashyap from, uh, who is a research scholar in the Department of English, Mahatma Gandhi Central University of Bihar. Uh, she will be presenting a paper named Emancipatory Journey to Cultural Roots of Africa in Walkers, the Color Purple and Possessing the Secret of Joy. Thank you. Hello, thank you uh, so much. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are absolutely audible. Okay, good. Good evening, everyone. As it's clear from the title itself that the paper discusses how a symbolic or physical journey to Africa is important in understanding one's cultural roots and helps in the emanci emancipation of Alice moment, Interrupting yeah. you for a moment. Uh, you are just giving an audio presentation, right? There yeah, is yeah. no PPT. Yeah, I'm, okay. sorry, I'm yeah. just making sure that nothing is like we are not being uh, able to see anything. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, thank you. So, as it's clear from the title itself, you know, that discusses a uh, uh, symbolic or a uh, physical journey to Africa, which becomes important in understanding one's cultural roots and helps in the emancipation of the protagonists of Alice Walker's two major fictions, The Color Purple and Possessing the Secret of Joy. So, here I go. Uh, the genre of African-American writing has a complicated history, considered to have begun from the slave writings, mostly in the form of a memoir or autobiography. It has, in the recent times, achieved unprecedented dimensions. Early writings often had the patronage of white men as publishers and editors, thus refraining the writers from making any explicit reference to the discriminations levied by white men, for such a mention would have called for censorship or a more severe repercussions. So much so that for a long period of time, the slaves were legally debarred from accessing education, lest education would enable them to realize the nature of oppression and would eventually lead to protest and disruption of the white hegemony. Racial disc discrimination did become an oft referred issue in the later writings. Uh, in the writings of black female authors like Morrison, Walker, Hurston, Hooks, especially in the African American context, that's what I'm talking about. The focus grows wider to also accommodate gender discrimination and thus the double discrimination that fell in the lot of black women. In the last century, these, uh, for the past century, these uh, writings this one, have expanded their purview to incorporate the history, politics, mythology, folklore, and self-expression of writers and their characters. While Walker coined the term womanism to include concerns related to African-American women who or black women in general, who she thought were excluded from the scope of feminism, Morrison refuses to attach herself to any particular ideology or reason. The term revisionist history also gained popularity in these years, signifying the attempt to rewrite history, which had been discriminatorily written previously. The women writers were aware of the fact that the female voices and stories were often understated and marginalized in the earlier writings and attempted to represent those who were either misrepresented or left at the bay. Alice Walker emphasizes and encourages adopting a more universal approach in bringing about equality. To the Eurocentric idea of feminism, which she believes covers only the concerns related to white women, she prefers womanism, which she explains, to quote, a black feminist or feminist of color who loves other men and women sexually or non-sexually, appreciates and prefers women's culture, women's emotional flexibility, and women's strength, is committed to survival and wholeness of entire people, male and female, a womanist is usually referring to uncourageous, audacious, courageous, or willful behavior, wanting to know more and in great depth than is considered good for one. Traditionally universalist, loves music, loves dance, loves the moon, loves the spirit, loves lo love and food and roundness, loves the struggle, loves the foe, loves herself. A womanist is to feminist as purple to lavender. However, we must know that this idea of womanism did not only focus on women, but also incorporates men and it has an universal appeal. Amidst all the discouraging forces, Walker believes that the bond of sisterhood can pave the way to attain, attain equality in true sense. The sisterhood between the women and characters in the novel is therefore one of the recurring themes in African-American literature. Amidst all kinds of oppressions and the discriminations against them, it is this bond which sustain, sustains them. The same idea of sisterhood becomes significant in The Color Purple. Sally and Nettie share a remarkable bond and have an unconditional love for one another though they are also biological sisters. But with Sof also Sophia, her daughter-in-law, lends her moral support, lends 
uh, lends moral support to Selly and they begin working on quilt, which symbolizes the initial step towards Selly's freedom. The arrival of Shug Avery helps Selly discover her own self and body, and she eventually shuns away the imposed idea of a white god in favor of a loving god. Later, Selly leaves for Memphis, where she, with Shug's support, she achieves financial independence. The same bond of sisterhood is strength, strengthens Tashi in possessing the secret of joy, wherein the former can always depend on Olivia's consistent support. Quote unquote, through bribery, even manages to enter in the prison kitchen to provide fresh dishes, dishes to her friend and sister in law, serving sentence therein. By the end, Tashi is able to bond with dead Lisette, her husband's lover, through a letter of confession. A physical or metaphorical journey to Africa plays a crucial role in the character development of protagonists. The journey to attain the knowledge of one's root becomes important in order to achieve emancipation. For Sally, the metaphorical journey is accomplished through the letters from her sister, which carries the spirit of Africa, gives her vital information about her children and the surroundings, and more importantly, facilitates her self-growth. It is seemingly impossible to assert one's identity and win the struggle to achieve it until one has known and accepted his or her identity in entirety. Sally is not only the victim of abuse and oppression at the hands of firstly her stepfather Alfonso and later her husband Mr. Albert, but is also victimized, victimized by discriminatory forces in the society. She is not a white American and therefore she must also be conscious of her African self combined with a women's self to be able to identify herself completely, which is just an initial step on the course of emancipation. For Tashi, who belongs to a Lincoln community of Africa, the journey is different. She moves to America with her husband, Adam, but carries the scars of past, which haunts her throughout her life until she revisits Africa to face and ultimately kill the de demon. Walker, expounding on the basis of her American and African experiences, believes that oppression of one community by another or that of a woman by men is a universal phenomenon and, prevalent and is prevalent everywhere. She therefore writes, the African male order, just like its American counterpart, denies the validity of female expression girl children are not permitted to participate in the education provided by the missionaries and they are considered the property of their of first their fathers and then their husbands as a sign of their entry into womanhood they undergo a ritual of sacrifice sacrifice sacrification which literally marks their marks their role in the society uh, what she is referring to is circumcision she further develops these ideas in her novels the color purple and possessing the secret of joy in the former, through Nettie's letters, she brings forth the issue of marginalization of women in African society, thereby acquainting Sally with the African way. The young girls of the community are debarred from education, and Olivia, Sally's child adopted by Samuel and Corinne, is the only girl who attends school. In the latter work, Walker delineates the traumatic life of Tashi, who went through the female initiation ceremony in frenzy, with the feeling of pride in her indigenous rituals. It is much later that Tashi realizes that the so-called initiation into womanhood through genital mutilation is in fact, and other rituals, is in fact a way to subjugate women and deprive them of their womanhood. Tashi's, acts of, Tashi's act of going through the female initiation ceremony also finds a brief mention in the color book. Nettie's letters also provide a glimpse of an entirely detached world from that of Sally's. The world of Lincolns and the deplorable condition of women in the society. The women of the community are so powerless that, to quote, the husband has life and death power over the wife. If he accuses one of his wives of witchcraft or infidelity, she can be killed, unquote. The men are free to keep as many as wives as they want. The women, on the other hand, can't even look in a man's face and is supposed to, quote unquote, look instead at his feet or his knees. The Lincoln community, therefore, is not aloof from the dreadful grip of patriarchy and male dominance. So the description of the Olympian community and oppression of women therein, Walker draws attention towards the fact that gender oppression is not only Sally's problem or something which is prevalent only in African-American society, but that this is universal. The women characters in the novel come together through a bond of sisterhood, which enables them to do away with the shackles of patriarchal forces. For Tashi, to come into terms with her new identity as Evelyn in a quote-unquote other colder continent, that is the reference to America. With the baggage of a deprived womanhood and with the realization of her subordinate position in a new country is an experience that comes at the cost of her sanity. While Tashi spent her initial years and young adulthood in colonized Africa, Sally becomes aware with its various aspects through Nettie's letters. Even on her return, Tashi is sentenced to a prison, which was 
quote unquote, built during colonial period. Thus suggesting that until one achieves freedom from regressive traditions, one cannot really be considered free. Nettie described the same colonial period as hard times when slave trade was common in Africa and rights to Sali. Although Africans once had a better civilization than European, though of course even the English do not say this, I get this from reading a man named J. Rogers, for several centuries they have fallen on hard times. This is how uh, Nettie describes colonialism to uh, Sali. The colonizers exploited and colonized nation civilization and used their wealth and resources to amplify their own resources. In Senegal, Neti comes across the blackest people, quote unquote, the blackest people they had ever seen and is surprised to see white French people in droves who have even imposed their own language on them. The people of Senegal spoke not only Senegalese, but also French. Even the cabinet of the president Tubman consists of, quote unquote, a lot of white looking colored men. It is among them that Neti first comes across the term natives and hears people groaning about the natives notoriety incorporating with them, which can perhaps pass as natives' passive revolt against the aggressives. Betty also informed Sally about the cocoa plantations, which were actually owned by people in Holland and was invigilated by their representatives living in Senegal. They make the natives work hard on the plantations and reap profit at the cost of the natives' labor. In a succeeding later letter, while describing her journey from Senegal to Olinka, Neti writes about her observation of a port town. The whole place is run by white men, but some of the stalls that sell produce are rented out to Africans. The various statements suggest that the economic exploitation of the colonizer, of colonizers were supposed to pay for even installing a shop and running it. Through these descriptions, Neti delineates a vivid picture of the oppressive Dutch settlement in Senegal. The description foresh uh, foreshadows the condition of the people of Olenka and their colonization in the hands of English colonials and French colonials also, which begins mainly with the construction of the road. Initially, the Olenkans celebrated the construction of road, thinking it was meant for them. Neti realizes the fault of the people and thus comments. I think Africans are very much like white people back home, in that they think they are the center of the universe and that everything that is done is done for them. It is difficult to say if it was the advent of colonialism, this making same culture reinforcement is a powerful form of resistance for the Olinkans or some other reason that Tashi frantically left everything behind to go through the initiation ceremony. Tashi recalls how Olivia begged her not to go. However, her determination to uphold the custom of the community and concern for the, for the struggle of her people was hard to win. It is only later that Tashi realizes the repercussions of her action. She figured out the reason for her sister's death, who had died bleeding of circumcision. Her own child, Betty, whose, quote unquote, head was yellow and blue and badly mishappened, when born later on turned out to be retarded, and she was forced to abort a daughter whose birth she thought would again bring upon the same ordeal. Adam might have got the same scars on his face to assure Tashi of his unconditional love, but they were deeper scars which remained unseen, but affected her life severely. Tashi notes at a point, after three months of trying, he had failed to penetrate me. Each time he touched me, I bled. And thus she goes on ex ex expressing how circumcision has affected her sexual life as well. Moreover, the anger drove her, out, drove her so out of her mind that she went back to Africa to avenge her sister Dura's death and the losses she, ha she had to bear. She murdered Sunga, I think if pronounced him, Lisa, who had by then become a national celebrity for upholding traditional values. Though she is sentenced to death on this account, this death paves way for her liberation. For Sally, the journey to the roots is one which connects her to the cultural roots and brings upon knowledge of self. She learns of rampant racism in her native land, of slavery, gender discrimination, and even her monotheistic faith changes into pantheism to become more accommodative. The journey in Tashi's case, however, is more confrontational. She confronts her past to attain liberation. Walker's aim through these journeys, perhaps, is to find out a way for the realization of the survival whole of the Blacks, and particularly of Black women. Yeah, with that, I would like to end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, you. Mahima Kasha, for your presentation. Um, anyone has any questions or comment to make? Any questions? Okay. Um, I don't have a question. I was just thinking as I was listening to your paper. 
that it is always like when we talk about African culture, the first thing that comes to our mind is, of course, the colonial operation. For women, it is not only double operation that we were talking about, uh, which we see in other uh, parts of uh, the continent as well, for India, for the Dalit women, it's always double marginalization. But also, I think that is what is the most important thing is women are always also torn apart like their uh, cultural and national identity at stake uh, at the hand of the colonizer or the others uh, oppressors and at the same time they also sometimes give them window of opportunity window of escape from the uh, previous oppressors that is the patriarchal oppressions of the of their own culture so it is always a question of choice as i uh, as we started the uh, entire session on the question of motherhood and choice. I think for women, everything is like we are uh, very uh, badly spoiled for choice. Uh, like all choices have their cons and some uh, good uh, points, but we are uh, always already torn apart between choices, which identity to choose. Yeah, definitely that's there. And as you mentioned about colonialism and uh, other aspects like, you know, discrimination, gender discrimination, also racial. At the same time, you know, the, the traditional values that we talk about, as I talked about here in case of Tashi, that she had to go through genital mutilation because that is what tradition, you know, expected from her. So yeah. we see, you know, that uh, there are different other forces as well. And even much before colonialism. Now, see, we have to also understand here, you know, because I am... I myself could not uh, explore that point a lot, and that's why I left it in, uh, you know, kind of um, somewhere midway. But then again, you know, this culture reinforcement, because one evening what happens is Tashi leaves everybody and goes and joins these um, the fundamentalist, what we call today, but, you know, this very traditionalist group, you know, and goes and goes through initiation and all that. So, you know, we have to understand if this comes as, you know, this re culture reinforcement comes as a response to colonialism, you know, because they think that it, it kind of yeah. brings a cultural stagnancy. At the same time, we have to see that this was not just because of colonialism. This might have persisted for a long time because, you know, uh, later on there is a description that how the entire women of the community loved this just one man who was supposed to be the leader. And this leader himself had only scars, but the other women, you know, had to go through this other process. And then there is a long conversation. So you see, you know, there are different other factors as well in that case. So... Yeah, we st and again, again, we talk about motherhood. I think in her case, she bears a child, Betty, who is, you know, because uh, she because of circumcision and all that, you know, she bears a child who has to ha who comes with a mishap and head, and later on, later on, turns out to be retarded. For the same fear, the pain she goes through, and also perhaps for the fear that other child might also have to face the same predicament, she aborts her daughter. So you know, this motherhood is also in some way not achieved. And tradition to discrimination and all of these factors, I think, play a very important role that, you know, this very important side is uh, becomes somehow unattainable or even can, we don't do it for the fear that, you know, uh, they might have to face this situation or perhaps you might also have to go to the same model again. Yes, that's what I would say. Yes. Like for women, every uh, identity, every attempt to belong to a particular identity demands certain amount of sacrifice. Like if yes, you want right. to impose your, like if you want to conform to your uh, racial identity against the um, white oppressor, you have to go through this bodily pain of me. Yes, yes, certainly. Yes. Prices, you always pay the price with your body yes, or yes, your yes. home or with your child. Yes. yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you all of you very much. So I would um, invite uh, Indrajit uh, Shorka to deliver a vote of thanks for all of us. And let me just quickly tell uh, you that it was a very, very uh, enlightening experience to listen to all of your papers. Like we generally look at African culture. When we talk about African culture, look at African culture, we generally think about colonialism and the effect of it, it was um, to be understood from your papers, it became clear, more clear that how many uh, systems of oppression and consequently how many struggles for identity actually uh, cuts each other to create what we now recognize in a very broad way as the African culture or 
or the African identity. There are many things from the rootlessness that comes from colonial uh, aftermath of colonialism to the um, roots that uh, new trees sort of uh, so the roots of these trees that the colonizers brought in the places they colonized. So it's a uh, rather, I would say, um, pervasive process. The colonization was a pervasive process and equally pervasive is the aftermath of it. That is the struggle to get out of it, struggle to build up an identity. It is as I was listening to that paper about how we, uh, by Shyam Mukherjee from IIT Kanpur, where he was talking about how it is the we should go back to uh, the natural boundaries of floras and fauna. I was thinking that almost this uh, whole process of colonization created, uh, tried to create a simulated world, almost a new world. I mean, the entire natural world was changed to a certain extent. And at least if not changed, they were classified as something this or that. Some Everything was classified according to the rule of the oppressors or change. So it becomes a multi-layered struggle and also the question of the gender. So thank you everyone for uh, the, the wonderful paper. So please, Indraji Sharkar, uh, I invite you for the vote of thanks. Hello. Uh, so good evening. Good evening, everybody. Let me thank you all for your presentation. Uh, I hope you all have enjoyed this session and uh, African culture, poetry, and literature is so diverse and it's a tremendous range of diversity. Uh, we have attempted at least, we have attempted at least to uh, experience some uh, outstanding thoughts from some uh, some of our participants. And all of our participants have agreed with some. Uh, the identity issue that is so crucial in uh, post-colonial world. Uh, so, um, hope all of you have enjoyed the session, and thank you all. So, with this, we are going to conclude this session, and uh, I'd like to thank Professor Rajogiri for our opinions on identity as well. So, thank you all. Yes, thank you all. Um, um. Thank you, Indraji Sharka, for such a wonderful vote of thanks and introductory note. So I think we can end the session now with all your permission. <laughs>